should probably have one of these or something like one of these. This is an iPhone 5S. One of the things that we are trying to make very convenient for you is the way that you give. And so you can do that by putting money in an offering plate, as we just did. But you can also download or upload, whatever, however you load it, the Parkside app. You can go into the App Store and find Parkside Christian Church. Now make sure you get the Parkside Christian Church that's on Salem Road, because there's a lot of Parksides out there, and we don't want you sending your tithe to that Parkside Church in Cleveland. So make sure you get the one here in Cincinnati. Um, But it's a very convenient way to um, make your offering to God in the convenience of what you carry around in your pocket. So a lot of you have one of these or, or something similar to this. How many of you have an iPhone? Wow, okay. Just about uh, 75, 80% of the congregation has got an iPhone. If you don't have one of those, you've probably got an Android. But uh, you might have an Apple computer. Or you might have had or still have an iPod, an iPhone, or maybe an iPad. And all of these uh, technical toys that we enjoy are thanks to a genius by the name of Steve Jobs, who co-founded... Apple computers back in 1976. He was fired from the company that he created in 1985, and he came back to Apple as the CEO in 1997, and he led them back to the promised land. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2003. And Steve Jobs, one of of his goals before he died was to build a boat large enough to carry his family on a trip around the world. But he never got to do that because he died peacefully at home in the company of his family on October the 5th, 2011. The day of his death was the day that followed the introduction of the Apple iPhone 4S. And that was an Apple event that he watched from his deathbed. Steve Jobs was a masterful public speaker, and his most famous speech was the one that he gave at Stanford University for the commencement address in 2005. He never graduated from college, but he felt very honored to have been invited to do this. The speech that he gave was made up of three different stories, and the third story in his speech had to do with his death, which was imminent, and also had to do with everybody else's death. Listen to this two-minute excerpt from his speech. Uh, There is text on the screen, but the voice is that of Steve Jobs. For the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, These things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. About a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a scan at 7.30 in the morning and it clearly showed a tumor on my pancreas. I didn't even know what a pancreas was. The doctors told me this was almost certainly a type of cancer that is incurable and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. My doctor advised me to go home and get my affairs in order, which is doctor's code for prepare to die. It means to try and tell your kids everything. You thought you'd have the next 10 years to tell them in just a few months. It means to make sure everything is buttoned up so that it will be as easy as possible for your family. It means to say your goodbyes. It means to say your goodbyes. (laughs) 
It's very interesting to hear what a man who has the world by the tail and is successful by every measure, to hear what he has to say when he knows that death is imminent. God's truth is true no matter who speaks it. Even if it comes from an unbeliever like Stephen Jobs, who disavowed any connection to Christian faith. But what he has to say is profoundly true. He says, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. (laughs) For the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror and every morning asked myself if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know that I need to change something. We have a vision as the people of the Parkside Christian Church. Our vision is this, that we will be people who are helping each other pursue God's purpose for our lives every day. That's what we're about. And that's the appeal that I make every time I'm here on, on stage to say this specifically is God's purpose, God's desire for us and to make that clear and then to persuade all of us to step into that purpose, to run after that purpose, understanding that there's nothing more important than that. There's nothing better that we can invest ourselves in, in life than to know what God's desire and will is for us. And so, if you discover, as you take this kind of an evaluation, looking in the mirror, looking at what it is that you're about to do from day to day, if you discover that you are pursuing something other than what God's desire is for you, what God's purpose is for you, then for God's sake, and I'm not cursing when I say that, for God's sake and for your sake, change course. As we come to the close of this appeal that's being made by the author of the letter that we call the Hebrews, he's writing to Hebrew Christians who were toying with the idea of rejecting their faith in Christ. And going back to the old ways, to something that they think is just as good or maybe even better. And he's saying to them, pull up, pull back, change course, don't step off the edge. Consider the gravity of what you are about to do because you are giving up on that which is most precious and that is the understanding that God is a part of your life through his son Jesus Christ which is the only way that that can happen you are giving up that which is most valuable change course he says run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us as we are pursuing God's purpose in our lives run with perseverance every day Join the pursuit. Don't give up. Run with tenacity because life's highest purpose is to run with Christ and for Christ. And he finishes this word of encouragement to these people with some very practical statements as to here's how you live out God's purposes. Here's day to day what that looks like. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. That's that's boilerplate, isn't it, for the people of God? Jesus said the best thing we can do, the greatest commandment that we can follow is to love God with greatest enthusiasm and to love each other in the same way that we love ourselves. And so that's what we do as, as a family called Parkside here. We love each other. We encourage each other. We pray for each other. If we have physical needs, we reach out and help each other with, with those things. But we love passionately. And we love people outside of, of our fellowship here. There's no, there are no limits, no barriers, no, no ending place for where and, and how we love. 
Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. That's one of the practical ways that we show love. By so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Back in the 90s, we used to make a lot of trips into Haiti. And on one particular trip, we were in Miami waiting for, for the flight. And this guy comes walking up to our group and asks if he can join us and hang out with us once we get to Haiti. Well, that's, that's kind of strange. He didn't explain himself any more than to say his name was Bob. So the leader of the group, Larry Owen, said, sure, jump in. There's always room for one more. Flew into Port-au-Prince and followed us up into the Northwest and hung out with us. Kind of kept to himself. He was very mysterious. Didn't tell us a whole lot about himself. We extended him every uh, term of, of hospitality. He ate meals with us, gave him a place to sleep. But then he'd be pretty much get off to the side and just kind of observe. And we, we wondered, is this, is this guy an angel, maybe? The one thing he told us was that he had spent time in Somalia. And this was uh, during the time of the Civil War there, just before uh, Black Hawk Down. And he'd made some trips in there doing some things. The other thing we noticed about him was that uh, he smoked. Now, you weren't supposed to smoke on mission trips, but we gave him a special pass that he could smoke. He didn't know the rules. And so we got to call him. Oh, maybe he's an angel. I don't know. Do angels smoke? I don't know. Maybe that's part of his cover. So we, we, called, him, we called him Somali Bob, the smoking angel. Well, a few days into the trip, as he kind of followed us around with all the things that we were doing, finally we were at the orphanage in port au -Pay. And the, the, the orphanage building there had a roof that was leaking like a sieve. There was no money to replace that. Somali Bob comes walking up to Larry Owen, pulls a wad of bills out of his pocket, and peels off $10,000 and hands it to him. And he says, here, put a new roof on your orphanage. And then he was gone. The next morning, he was gone. Somali Bob, the smoking angel, came in from nowhere, one of those angels unawares that we had no idea who he was. Still don't, really. True story. Abraham and Sarah had that kind of an experience. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 18. They were out in the desert. They're in their tent. Three strangers walk up and extended every Middle Eastern hospitality to them, invited them in, gave them the very best of food and drink. And in the course of that, discovered that these were messengers from God. These were angels and revealed to them that they were going to have a son named Isaac. And so the author here says, we need to be people like that, who open ourselves and open our homes and are gracious to everyone with what we have. It's kind of a lost art among us today. There are a lot of reasons that we give as to why we don't invite people into our homes, whether it's somebody we know or somebody we don't. We're busy, so oh, our, our, the, house, the place is a mess. <laughs> you know, we haven't had time to clean the bathroom and, and all this and that as to why it's better to go to a restaurant or maybe just not even make the time to get together at all. But you know, there's something that's very special about your home that makes it the place to gather with people that you care about or people that you want to get to know. And the thing that makes it very special is that it's your home. And it's got your marks all over it. It's got your pictures on the walls of the people that you love. It's got the colors in the rooms that you have picked out. It's, it's a part of your physical heartbeat. And so there is a, a gift to be rekindled among us to where we open our homes to each other and invite each other in to this warm place where we live and exist but even also to strangers from time to time, not knowing what kind of a blessing God might have in store for us in that. We have a missionary who's going to come through in June. His name is Michael Madney. And we need a place for him to stay. I think one night on a Saturday night. And if you would like to offer hospitality to him, you let me know. And he will be your special guest that night. It will be June the 17th. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. 
Open Doors USA documents worldwide all that's going on in the lives of Christians around the world. Christians who die every month, every day, simply because they are Christians. Church properties that are destroyed, violence that's committed against followers of Christ. There's a tremendous hostility against Christ followers in many parts of the world. We need to remember those people, and we need to remember our partners that we are engaged with as the Parkside Church who work among these people, people who face these kinds of risks every day, and even our partners are at risk. We've got to be in solidarity with them and pray for them and let them know that they are not forgotten people. They are desperate to know that as they hang on to their faith, that somebody cares and somebody knows and somebody is praying for them. I'm not mentioning these names because I want to be able to put this sermon on the internet so we're not even saying these names in places out loud in the public forum. But I want to pray right now and ask you to join me in prayer for this concern. Father, we do understand that persecution is not uh, a, a concern or a problem of, of days past, but it, it's, it's as real as today. It's as real of, as this very hour. And we have brothers and sisters around the world who are frightened, who don't know what the future brings because there are people who are threatening their future only because they follow you and carry the name of Christ in their lives. And so, Father, help us to never forget to pray for these, knowing that you send special comfort through your Holy Spirit, through your Word. You send it through other people. You send it through us, through any communication that we can make that is safe communication. You do it through so many ways. Father, prompt us to do what we can to relieve the burden of these people, but to pray for them, that they will stay strong, that they will keep their courage, that they will understand that this is worth holding on to whatever price they might pay. I pray that if there's something we can do tangibly, something we can send, some political person we can talk to that might intervene on their, their behalf, that we would do these things. But Father, help us to always remember our, our brothers and sisters as if we were suffering with them because we are, because it's the pain that's within our body, the body of Christ. They are family and we need to hurt with them and cry with them. Father, thank you for hearing this prayer and help us to continue in our prayers for them to always remember and never forget. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Persecution was a daily reality for the people that the author was writing to here. They had friends and family in prison that they were concerned about. And it's a reality today. Marriage should be honored by all in the marriage bed, kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer <clears throat> and all the sexually immoral. God is very serious about the goodness and the sacredness, the holiness of marriage. Intimacy, sexual intimacy is to be reserved for marriage. And we are to guard our purity before marriage and honor our vows within marriage. It's a clear teaching, a clear expectation, easy to understand and really easy to do if we intend to live that way. And that's one of the purposes of God for our lives. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? These were people who were losing their livelihoods. And the author is saying, in spite of that, trust God. Continue to be generous with what you have and be content with what you have. Remember that promise that God has made. And he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. And it's an affirmation of what it means to, to believe in God. It isn't just that that mental assent. Yes, I believe there is a God. It means to trust God. It means to put yourself out there and put yourself on the line to see if God really will keep his word in your life. And that relates to giving. If I release some of my worldly goods to God, is he, will he really take care of me? And he says, yes, I will. 
One of the things that's true of us right now at Parkside is we have said more, I have said more about giving since last November than I suppose I have in the last 10 years as an encouragement to us to be faithful and to be trusting. And I don't know, maybe I need to shut up because one of the things that we've discovered is that right now and for the past few months, we have flatlined in our giving. It hasn't increased at all. There may be various reasons for that, and I don't know what all of them are. We've tried to make it easy. Not only can you put it in the plate, you can do it on an app, you can do it online, you can do it through your bank. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. But you might say to me, I am giving, and I'm giving faithfully, and I'm giving sacrificially, and God bless you. And so maybe that's it. You're there, and that's good. But maybe you're in the situation where you're just, you're just not sure whether God can be trusted with, if I gave him even 10% of what I take in, can I trust God to take care of us with that shift? There's only one way to learn to trust God, and that's to trust God. <laughs> to make him keep his promise to you and find out if he really will. And he really will. The definition of prosperity is this, to find freedom from greed, to find freedom from this mentality that I just got to have more, got to have more. I want to get more. I got to have more to somehow shift our thinking in that vein as to what our desires are and to find contentment with enough. You know, this is, this is enough. Our needs are being net met and this is enough. And couple that with, with a generous spirit that even releases more to people in need. That's the secret to prosperity. Steve Jobs said something else. It's profound. He says, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night saying we've done something wonderful, that's what matters to me. Wouldn't that be a, a nice kind of a, a philosophy to follow through every day? As we get to the end of, of the day, go back and evaluate what's happened to say... Yeah, I did something wonderful in the name of God today that made a difference in somebody's life. And if something material is tied up in that, all the better. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's invoking the memory of, of leaders in the church who have probably died. People who have gone on, but are wonderful role models. Maybe these are ones who have even died for their faith. But examples of what it means to follow Christ and never give up and never look back. He says, you need to imitate these people. We are very fortunate here at Parkside that we, we have still some of leaders from the past that are with us, still part of our family here, and still a great influence for us and great role models to follow. There was a, a man who was the interim minister at Parkside Christian Church. Some of you, if you don't know the history of Parkside, we changed our name in 2003 from Mount Washington Church of Christ to Parkside. Same church. Back in 1968, a man by the name of Bob Hensley became the interim minister here at Parkside. Bob has, has gone on. Bob has died. But his wife is still with us. Joanne, are you here? Joanne, where are you? Right there. You see that hand on the back row? That is Joanne Hensley, his wife, and he was one of the leaders of, of Parkside. And so uh, his partner in life is still with us. Glad you're here, Joanne. Another man who led Parkside, Wayne Stout. He was in the first service this morning. Wayne came to Parkside in 1969 and served here until 1980. And if you go back and read the history of the Mount Washington Church of Christ as it was then, those were kind of golden years here. And in 1977, they did an evaluation of all the churches in the tri-state. And of all those churches, Mount Washington Church of Christ was the one that showed the most consistent growth in 1977. So maybe we, that trophy is still sitting around here somewhere. But that was under the leadership of Wayne Stout, and he 
and his wife Janet. That's a second marriage for both of them. Janet was, is, was the wife of a man who was a terrific elder here at Parkside, Vic Schaefer. Well, they've gotten together, and Wayne and Janet are still here with us, and oftentimes we'll greet you coming in the door on Sunday morning, and I feel so rock-solid good because I just know that, that Wayne Stout is still here. You know, it's kind of like one of the girders in the building is still here holding us together, and what an example he has set and continues to set for us. If you want to know how to live like Jesus, look at Wayne Stout. David Ray. David Ray became senior minister at Mount Washington Church of Christ in 1987. And the church continued to grow and continued to thrive under his leadership. David, are you here? There he is. Higher than that. Come on, David. Raise your hand. If you're newer to Parkside, you probably don't know who David and, and Carol are. But uh, David is now the interim president of Cincinnati Christian University. You've been interim for a long time, David. I think, I don't know. I think they're kind of liking what's happening there. But uh, dynamic good man. You want to know how to live it? Watch David Ray. And is one of the leaders here that has meant much to us and continues to meet much, mean much to us. And David, I'm glad you're here. It just makes me feel better. Keep coming, okay? The ultimate example, of course, is Christ. He finishes that, that encouragement by saying, and Christ is the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's the ultimate example. No variation, no wavering, no shifting. Look to Jesus. That's how you live. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Evidently, the people then were, were all caught up in diet. You know, kind of, you are spiritually what you eat, and so you could eat this and not eat that. And the author is saying, you, you need to get over that. Don't get all hung up on food. It's not that you are what you eat spiritually. You are who you love. You are who you serve. And that would be Christ. He's the one that we consume. He's the one that we want to take in and to nourish us. And food is, is very secondary to that. Then he talks about the fact that uh, the, the ones who minister at the sacrifices and, and food... The sacrifice became a part of their food. The priests that would come in, they got some of the choicest pieces of the meat that came from the sacrifices. And so it's, it's almost like this jogs something in the mind of the writer here. He says, and while we're on the subject of priests making sacrifices, consider this. He says, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. That's kind of a curious thing. He's talking about the Day of Atonement. You can read about it in, in Leviticus 16. That was the day in the Jewish calendar when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, either in the tabernacle when they were traveling in the wilderness before the temple and then into that most holy place in the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat of God on top. And he would take the blood of a bull and a goat and would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat only happened once a year and only the high priest could go in there to be in the presence of God in that way and that would would compensate somehow for his sins the sins of the priest and the sins of the nation the sins of the people but they would take this is what's kind of curious they would take the part parts of the animals that weren't useful the waste, the leftovers, and they would carry those clear outside of the camp. That's a reference to there in the wilderness when the encampment, it was a very large encampment, take it clear outside away from everybody and burn these worthless pieces of the sacrifice. Oh, what's that got to do with anything? And so, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Today is the beginning of what we call the Passion Week. It's the beginning of the end of the last week of Jesus' life. Or it looked like it was going to be the end, <laughs> but then it turned out it was just the beginning. And we're going to celebrate that next week. Friday, you can come and, and we will ponder and contemplate and we will grieve over the death of Jesus Friday night, 6.30. But Sunday morning... 
It's all different. We're going to celebrate 9, 30, and 11 o'clock. And you come back and you bring your friends. You bring anybody who hasn't ever heard the good news of Jesus. And they will understand what it's all about. Jesus Christ coming back from the dead and what that means to us. But on the week leading up to that, Jesus had a ticker tape parade that was thrown for him as he rode into Jerusalem. And the crowds were just beside themselves, throwing confetti and waving palm branches. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But the tide of public opinion turned against him very quickly that week. Jesus was, the, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders were never very glad to see Jesus show up in the temple. But especially at this point, he was not welcome in the temple in the city of Jerusalem at that point. He wasn't even welcome in the city by those self-righteous ones who held the keys to the city and who held the keys to a relationship with God there in that region. They hated Jesus so much that they, when they killed him, when they had him executed, they executed him outside of the city. He was buried outside of the city. Nobody took the blood of Jesus, that blood of sacrifice. Nobody caught that blood and carried it into the temple and carried it into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle it on the mercy seat. There was no mercy seat. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared a long time ago. No, his blood remained outside the camp. Those who were outraged with Jesus were outraged because he welcomed and consorted with and loved all the wrong kind of people. He loved sinners. He, he loved to be in the company of people who, were, who had bad reputations. He would go to celebrations and, and dinners with them. He would accept their hospitality in their homes. He would come up close to even touch people who were, who were lepers, untouchable people. He would be found in the company of, of people in an appropriate way, found in the company of women who had bad reputations. He was always doing that, being, being seen with foreigners, people who were the outsiders and the self-righteous people, the ones who got to determine who was close to God and who wasn't, were so offended by this until finally they couldn't stand it anymore and they had Jesus put to death. But that was, that was Jesus' heart. That was the point of, of the stories that he told. When he told the story of the Good Samaritan, what was he saying? Who was the hero of that story? It was a Samaritan. In the minds of the religious leaders of that day, these were what they called, these were the half-breeds. These were the contaminated ones. These were the ones who would be kindling for hell as far as God was concerned. They had no hope of ever coming into a relationship with God. And Jesus said, guess what? A new day is coming and the doors are being thrown open and everybody's going to be welcome. Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, everybody. That was the point of the prodigal son. That story. Saying, guess what, people? Get ready. The day is coming, and it's already here, that any and all people who desire a relationship with God will be able to come to him because God desires a relationship with them. And he nailed that point down even in his death because when he died on the cross, there in the temple, that curtain that separated that most holy place from the world. Nobody could go into the presence of God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, that veil, it's recorded in history, was torn from top to bottom. It was Jesus' last statement in death to say, See, the way is now open for everybody. The outcasts from, of God are now welcome to come in. And that is what my death has accomplished. And so he says, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. That's the example that we are to follow as the people of God, the people who follow Christ, the people of Parkside Christian Church who are pursuing the purpose of God because that is God's purpose for us, not to gather in a huddle with all the good people. We are only good people because God has made us good through his grace, through what was accomplished by Jesus Christ. It's the only reason we've been declared good. But we are outcasts. We are outcasts who have been redeemed. 
When something is redeemed, it means there is something that is considered to be without value, something that is worthless, but suddenly something is done to it or with it or for it that it becomes ultimately priceless. It's redeemed, and that's, that is us. We were, out, we were so far from God because of our sin, because of our guilt, because of how we rebelled against him. But Christ came in and redeemed us. He forgave us. He purified us. He declared us to be holy because of our faith in him. And now we have been given ultimate, ultimate value. We are sons and daughters of God. We are royalty here on earth. And that's not something for us to be arrogant about or to become full of ourselves over, but to realize that now we have the mandate to go out to our fellow outcast and to share the good news that Jesus Christ has cleared the way for the world to come back to God. That's the purpose of the people of the Parkside Christian Church, and that's the purpose that we are stepping into, that we are driving for. We want this community to have a sense that if some, for some reason we cease to exist, that Parkside, the people of Parkside were gone tomorrow, that this community would grieve and that they would say, oh, there's such a hole here. There's such a blessing missing in our lives. We miss those people because they understand that this is God's, we are God's goodness in their lives and that they are being drawn to God through us. Let us then go to him outside the camp, outside this building, outside of our Christian gatherings to go to the people, to our fellow outcasts that Christ died for. Outcasts going to outcasts and invite them in in the same way that Christ invited the outcast into his life. It's hard out there. It was hard for Jesus because he wasn't loved by everybody. There, he met with hostility. We will meet with hostility. There are people who won't like us any better than they like Jesus. But there are people who will be drawn to him through us. And that's what we've been commissioned to do. That's our purpose, and we are pursuing it. Join the pursuit. Get one of those T-shirts. Wear it proudly and join the pursuit. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. We are not home yet. Are we there yet? No, not yet. We're getting there. It's coming. But we're not home yet. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. There are two things that we can offer to God that he likes, he really likes a lot. The first is when we love the people that he loves. When we perceive someone who's in need and we reach out to them and we speak and we touch and we give and we offer and we pray, and when we do that in his name, oh, he's so pleased with that. He says, yes, those are the sacrifices that I like when you love the people that I love in very tangible ways. And the second, second sacrifice that he loves is a sacrifice of praise. When we speak of him and to him, when we honor him, revere him, praise him, when we sing to him. And we're going to do that right now. We're going to, believe me. Let's stand together. We're going to sing in the spirit of the people who were praising Jesus on that day of triumphal entry in Jerusalem. They were shouting. They were shouting these prophecies from the Old Testament. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is our Messiah. This is the promised one. And the grumpy people, the grumpy people who felt that they had the corner on who could, who could praise God and who couldn't and who was in and who was out with God. They were shouting, but they were shouting to Jesus saying, you need to rebuke those people. You need to tell them not to say that because that's inappropriate. It's blasphemous what they are saying, acclaiming you as the Messiah, as the promised one of God. And Jesus said in response to them, he said, oh, they can't help themselves. They are speaking the truth of God. And if they didn't say it, if they didn't cry out, you know what would happen? The rocks on the road would start cheering for me because praise cannot be silenced when the Messiah shows up. 
And so we are going to do that very thing. In, in the spirit of the triumphal entry of Christ, we're going to sing to him and declare to him this sacrifice of praise, this fruit of our lips, thanking him for who he is and the way that he has opened for us the way to God.